Hi everybody, I'm Yasmin and I'm the club president of Girl Up Beacon at the Beacon School. And today I'm really excited to be joined here with Congresswoman Meng from New York's sixth district. She's been tireless, she's been a tireless champion on issues pertaining to women and girls, especially around menstrual equality. I'm here with her today to talk about the importance of voting and finding your voice. So welcome, Congresswoman May. Thanks, Yasmin, and thanks, Girl Up, for inviting me here today. It's such an honor to be able to have this discussion with you and uh, lots of other uh, girl and women leaders uh, across the world. All right, so let's just jump right into our conversation. So. Um, kind of going off of like voting, um, I'm not really old enough to vote yet. I'm 16 years old right now, but I really can't wait for when I will be able to vote. So I just wanted to start this off by kind of visiting your past a little bit. So um, what was the first election that you voted in and how do you think it like impacted you? Sure. Well, before I get to that answer, Yasmin, I want to say that I have a bill to lower the voting age. I totally believe that 16 year olds should be able to vote. Our voting age uh, obviously is at 18 years of age, but that was also after it had been previously lowered from the age of 21. I believe that young people in so many ways, especially in today's world, uh, young people are the conscience of our country right now. Um, and whether it's working on issues of criminal justice reform, climate change, uh, gun safety legislation, on so many issues, our young people are at the forefront. And so I definitely believe that 16-year-olds um, and, and people uh, should be able to vote and to be able to uh, weigh in. Um, you know, when I first voted. I believe that I was a college student at the University of Michigan. Part of the reason why I got involved was because there was a local at the time, it was the Rock the Vote van. And it was a van or a bus, I forgot, that just parked in the middle of our campus. And I was really intrigued and wanted to be one of those young people who, even though I hadn't thought um, in a detailed way about what issues I might want to get involved in, I thought that I should at least be able to weigh in and cast my vote. Um, and so uh, that was really exciting to be involved uh, in that initial way during college. Mm -hmm. That's really great because I also think that like college is such a like pivotal time to get in there and vote but also if it's lower then you can get a lot more of the youth to get involved in the government which I think is really important because for me personally I find this kind of work really interesting and I know a lot of the people in my club are also equally interested in this but they feel like almost sometimes their voices aren't heard so your bill would be really great because I feel like um, this generation, more than any other generation in the past, is the most educated, has the access to the most information. So it would be good to lower the voting age, too, because it isn't like you have people that are unaware of the political situation. It's just you're bringing in more people that are aware to kind of have a say in their own future. So. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So kind of during these uncertain times, I think like the importance of voting is definitely kind of amplified. So why do you think it's important to get out there and vote? And how do you think like voting could be used as an extension of our voice? Well, definitely. Look, there are so many issues facing um, not just young people, but facing our country and our world these days. I have seen and met people, not just young people, but, um, you know, people who've never gotten involved ever before, people who've never cast a vote. Um, and, you know, I just think that people want a way to be able to show that they care about who their local elected officials are and wanting to know more about how government is functioning. Um, and so I think by the simple act of casting a vote, it's not just casting a vote, 
you know, through a paper ballot or going to the poll site. You know, for many people, especially here in New York, it's almost ceremonial. You know, you, you take your family, your parents or your kids or your significant other. Um, you get a sticker in New York and many other states throughout the country. Um, and it's really a valuable um, a privilege uh, that, that we have to be able to do this. Um, so many people in our history and in histories of cultures around the world have fought for this right for us to be able to go cast our vote uh, and make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think that's really great too because I just like having your voice being heard is just such a powerful sentiment and like as a whole. So I think it's really important like to make voting something which you can do with your family, which you can do with a bunch of different people and kind of have it be this like event almost because it gets more people to want to go out and vote rather than it being like a chore because it is our future that is on the line when you vote for someone. And like also in like local offices, especially because it's not just about a presidential election. It's also about voting in people that will affect your daily lives. And it's not just like a one time thing or once in four years kind of thing. It's something that you should be doing every two years or every time an election comes up in your district. So I think it's just so important also to run for just public office and like your local offices. So kind of going off of that idea of um, kind of getting more involved in your local office, how did you find your voice to run for like a public office? And what was your personal journey to becoming Congresswoman? Um, it's a really good question. I feel like I took a very unconventional path. You know, I'll be honest with you, as a kid growing up in Queens, New York, as a daughter of immigrants, my dad worked in a restaurant for most of his life. You know, we didn't grow up to be as a political family. Um, but I, I realized that even as a high school kid or a college age student, that the simple act of, you know, me helping my grandma and her friends translate documents um, was so simple to me and probably like a chore, but was really a way for me as a young person, a simple way even, um, to be able to help better the lives of people around me. And so I realized that, you know, as I was going through college and then law school, that you don't have to have a fancy title to run for office. You don't have to be wealthy to be able to help people around you and to make a difference in people's lives. Um, and so as I have been in um, local elected office more and more, I realize that there are so many issues that I work on that come directly from the everyday person, even people who are not, you know, wealthy people with fancy titles or with lots of experience. And so when I first decided to run for office, you know, I didn't know anything about politics. I never took a political science class, not that you should follow me. <laughs> um, I never ran for student government or anything like that. And like I said, I was a super shy kid. But what I did realize was that, um, you know, I, I had a voice. And then I, even though I didn't look like other elected officials who came ahead of me, that I was able to add value to a conversation and that I had uh, input that I thought was important enough to be able to make a difference in how people put policies and legislation together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also that the fact that there isn't like a mold that you have to fit in to get into the government is a really powerful idea. So I kind of just wanted to ask you, like, how can other women who maybe don't fit the mold or of what the like government has set up to be a like political person or a person that should run for office? So how do you think other women like you can find their voices? And why do you think it's important that more do like more people do run for office? Well, I will tell you, I think part of the reason why I never thought that I was going to run for office is because I never knew a politician that looked like me, right? I thought that you had to be, no offense to them, but I thought you had to be white and male and older. And I just didn't think that it was something that was uh, available to me. You know, I dreamt of working within the halls of government. I dreamt of working on policy for another politician, but never necessarily thought that I was able to do that. Um, and so as I got involved, really just volunteering, 
on um, campaigns and volunteering um, for, for local organizations, I realized that, hey, like I have some good ideas and I could help make a difference. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want to encourage everyone on this call, think about one, two or three issues that you care about. Uh, it could be the most simple thing. Um, it could be something that you care about and you're not sure if enough people, other people care about it. And it could be, you know, part of your role to help explain to other people why they might want to care more about a certain issue. You know, we all have the ability to add value to uh, these conversations and to make sure that we're making a good and effective change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think definitely everybody's like different perspective on a certain issue can just add so much value to that issue. And you can always move forward in the kinds of uh, problems that you're trying to solve, you know, that like if you have an issue that you are passionate about, you can always add value to that conversation. And I yes. think that like trying to find your voice and kind of voting and maybe, maybe even running for office is so important because even though like some people might not think that their voice matters, it actually matters so much more than you would believe. So I think that's really great. And you've used your voice um, in the conversation for a menstrual equity. So kind of going off of that, um, here at Girl Up, we wanna ensure that all girls have access to healthcare, including to menstrual hygiene products. And um, your, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, that and like how you became a fierce advocate on this issue? Yeah, so um, just to backtrack a little bit about what you were saying, absolutely, you know, like I said, there really weren't politicians that looked like me when I was growing up. Uh, even when I was in high school and college and law school, I just never met anyone that looked like me. Um, and so even when I got elected, you know, so when I first got elected, it was to the New York State Assembly, to the New York State Legislature. Um, I was pregnant. I had um, my, uh, pregnant with my second child and I already had a, a toddler at home. Um, and so, you know, worked on issues that some people thought were weird at first, but, you know, literally having to do with being a mom, being a, a woman, um, and even though, you know, there weren't enough other elected officials who were hearing about the same issues uh, as I was simply because I was a mom, um, I thought that, like you said, like, this is where I can add value to these conversations. You know, I'll be honest, even when I first got elected to Congress, you know, by that time, um, I had two kids, two little kids. They were ages three and five, I think. And I remember on one of the first weekends, you know, there were these, you know, big, important sounding events. And I thought, oh man, like I can't go because I need to be home and I want to spend time with my kids. And I thought that, you know, I, I, I doubted myself and I thought to myself, you know, is, is having a family, uh, is being a mom of two young kids, um, going to be a disadvantage to my career? Will I have enough time to be able to spend on my career? And as I, you know, progressed through my years in Congress, I realized that even though I might have an unconventional story um, and a different background than most of the other 80% of the men in Congress that I serve with, um, that there are people in our communities that um, need someone like me and there are more and more of elected officials like me to start telling their stories, even though they're unconventional. And they're only unconventional because there haven't been enough of people who look like you and me to be able to uh, sympathize and empathize and to value the importance of, of their issues and how we needed to improve um, our legislation. And so, you know, menstrual equity is one of those areas. I will be honest, I never thought about this issue growing up. Um, I, you know, was always fortunate enough to be able to afford these products. And uh, a high school or junior high school, I forget exactly what grade she was in, a young woman in my district wrote a letter to me about how uh, people were not able to get these products in homeless shelters in New York City. And I said to myself, when I first saw that, I said, no way, why wouldn't they be able to? 
And then I started doing some research and realized that the grants, the federal grants that our homeless shelters get in New York City and many across the country, they were not allowed to use that grant money to buy these menstrual products. And so that was the first sort of you know, exposure I had to what can Congress do what can your government elected officials do to help improve the situation? And so as I learned about this, I worked with um, other um, local elected officials too. We were able to work with the mayor and the city council to get these products um, available for free in our New York City public schools. That was not a reality when I was a kid. Um, and then we worked on the issue of making these products available to people who are in our prison system. Um, and, you know, these are just really basic human necessities that have not been necessarily treated as such in the history of our country. Um, and now we, you know, are still working to make progress. But I learned about that from one young woman in Queens. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because also I feel like when you kind of look at these people that don't have representation in the government like people like you and me but also the less fortunate people maybe someone who is homeless who doesn't have a direct connect to politics because they just simply aren't able to or it isn't they don't have the mind space for it at that time they don't think that they would be able to get their issues addressed because they think the government doesn't serve them. But the point of the government is to serve its people. So yes. it's important to have people that look different from the typical image of the white man in government in order to address all these different issues. And uh, I can also tell you like about um, menstrual equality and having these products in school. I didn't think twice about it because I've mm -hmm. always just been in the position where I've been able to access the mm -hmm. products. Um, like pads or tampons. And like when I went to school, they were also available. But I didn't realize that this wasn't a fact for many people, mm -hmm. like maybe even a couple of years earlier, maybe five years mm -hmm. or like seven years ago. I like it, it just, it's kind of um, impossible for me to imagine uh, like a situation like that. And for a lot of people that are in these elected offices, I feel like. They um, just don't know the situation for kids and other people that don't have their voice, which also kind of connects back to getting younger people um, voting because then you can get your issues addressed in Congress. And it's just such an important issue that I feel like needs to be addressed more, honestly. Yeah, definitely. And it really saddens me just in general. Like when I go speak to a local group um, who didn't expect my office to say, yeah, sure, she'll speak with you and she'll meet with you. And to see how surprised people are um, is always, you know, heartening because you're right. We are literally the, you know, my, my favorite uh, title of my job is the, the name that is outside of my door in Washington, D.C. If you go to my office, all of our offices in D.C., um, the word representative is outside of all of our doors. And so that reminds me that while we might not agree on every single issue, it is my job and my team's job to make ourselves accessible and to make sure that we are getting as, as wide of a, a spectrum of people's different views. And then to try to do our best to represent, you know, the majority uh, of what people want or try to fix a situation um, that might need uh, improving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great because also like the word representative itself, it, like it like illustrates that you are supposed to be like representative of um, the people rather than of any personal opinions or any of those things. So I think it's really important for people to vote in um, people that they are aligned with and uh, with values or with their policies and 
such because it's their job to reflect you as a person or as a community perhaps so it's really important to get people out there and vote especially with the election coming up the big one coming up this year um i think it's really great that people like you are out there trying to get more people involved and more people kind of knowledgeable on this topic of politics which almost it seems like a lot of people are averse to politics because they're like oh it, it's too corrupt or it's too much for me to understand as maybe someone who's older or younger or anything like that so i think that getting kind of politics more incorporated into the education system would also be really beneficial because you can get more people to be educated on certain topics. And I think it's just really great work that you're doing. So I kind of also just wanted to ask you like a little follow-up question on how are you like going into the community um, like you uh, with your like trail and stuff like that? Um, during the coronavirus, you mean? Um, during the coronavirus, perhaps, like, how it's, like, different from what before? Um, you are right. It's, it's really different. Um, and since uh, mid-March, we in New York have been under quarantine. Um, and so, for the most part, we've tried our best to stay at home. Um, my, my kids are at home, right? All, all uh, New York City school kids uh, are at home. And it has been very different, right? I can't, I can't um, have large events where I'm with my constituents. I can't attend their events that they might be hosting. I can't stop by, you know, the local, uh, you know, different tenant associations um, or civic group type meetings. Um, and so it's really hard to be able to connect with people. I will say though that people across the country, including my districts, have been really creative, right? You know, we've participated in so many virtual meetings like Zoom meetings, for example. Um, and that's been kind of fun too. We've done story times on Zooms. You know, we've, we've had conversations just like you and I are having uh, virtually, um, which has been good. And so um, part of my job in the last few weeks has also been trying to make sure that people have um, masks, for example. So PPE that uh, is, is so needed. Um, and especially in the beginning where New Yorkers really faced a shortage um, I remember we had, our whole office was, we spent the bulk of our days coordinating with all of our local hospitals, nursing homes, our, you know, train operators, nurses, um, you know, anyone and everyone who we wanted to make sure um, that they, as essential workers, had the proper equipment to protect themselves. And we weren't getting enough answers from our federal government. And so we were just so thankful to be able to um, get lots of donations from people around the country. Remember, New York was the epicenter of this pandemic. So people were, well, people were donating these um, items from around the country. And we would literally be, you know, delivering boxes to all these different venues. Um, when we uh, finish delivering to them what we've been doing in, you know, as much of a socially and safe distant way as possible, you know, we'll just uh, put a table up, you know, in a different busy uh, intersections in our district and just try to hand out PPE to people who are walking around, just trying to make sure that the average person is able to have these products too. Um, so, you know, we've been trying to be creative. So most of it's virtual, uh, a lot of outreach on emails and phones, um, and then literally, you know, meeting people in the streets, six feet uh, yeah. away, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've had to be very creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really great. I think like also I imagine it would be getting a little more difficult now that a lot of people are kind of taking the um, six feet rule a little less seriously than they did kind of in April and stuff like that. So I would imagine that you would have to be like distributing a lot more masks and things like that and kind of yeah, uh, 
kind of trying to get all these people to still be safe, even though like they're going out now that it's summer or anything like that. So I think it's really great work that you're doing. And um, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining me in this um, fireside chat. And it's so inspiring to hear how you came to find your voice. And I know a lot of other young people would also be agreeing with me, the people watching this. So I just wanted to, again, thank you on your leadership for um, ensuring all women and girls have access to menstrual hygiene products, because it really is an important issue that maybe a lot of more privileged people don't really think about. So um, yeah, thank you. We just need more people like you kind of championing these issues. And I know you're an inspiration to me and a lot of other people kind of that are that want to get into um, the government. So. <laughs> oh, Yasmin, I'm so inspired by you and your peers. I was nowhere near as organized and eloquent as, as mm -hmm. you are when I was in high school. So I am in all of you. Um, and I, and I, I, I want to remind everyone, and people might not even realize, you know, we, most of the bills that I've passed into law in Congress, those ideas have come from everyday people. They don't come from just people with fancy titles or a lot of money. Um, and so I want to take this opportunity to encourage everyone on this call. Um, if you feel like there is an issue that you care about, an issue that your local elected officials like myself should care more about, please don't hesitate. Write a letter, make a phone call. It's not always going to be easy. You know, people are very busy. They might not... Um, uh, fully appreciate it the first time around, but but don't give up. You know, I want to say that you know we've been able to work on so many issues from stemming from everyday constituents. Um, I also spend a lot of time, and zooming has actually made it easier. Um, been able to talk virtually to a lot of high school and college students from around the country, especially during this last few months. And I do this because I want them to be encouraged that an average person, someone like me, can be involved, can run for office, um, and continue to serve our communities. And everyone has the ability and the talent to do it as, as long as you care. And, and you all care because you're all here today with, uh, with us having these discussions. So I just want to encourage all of you to keep up the great work, stay involved, even when it's hard. And uh, I look forward to all that you have to accomplish one day.